one kernel of grain yields a hundred measures. Once again, during the sowing season, the boy went out with his father to sow grain in their field. Now even as his father sowed, the boy Jesus planted, but a single grain, and after harvesting and tossing it, he garnered a full one hundred measures from it. Then he called the needy of that town to the threshing floor, and distributed the grain among them, and Joseph gathered what remained, and he was eight, when he worked this wonder. The lions worship Jesus. Jericho, the Jordan River. There is this road which passes from Jericho over to the place on the Jordan River, where the children of Israel had crossed over, and it is said that the Ark of the Covenant once rested there. Now Jesus, who by then was eight years old, left Jericho and headed out for the Jordan. This path was not safe for men to walk, because over by the side of the road, not far from the riverbank, there was this cave where a lioness lay nursing her cubs. Jesus came from Jericho knowing full well that the lioness had recently brought forth a litter in that place, and he went right in before them all. Now as soon as the lions caught sight of Jesus, they all ran up and adored him. And the whole time that Jesus sat within the cave, the little cubs rubbed up against him and played with him, even as the older lions kept their distance and lowered their heads, worshipping him and patting their tails affectionately upon him. Now those who were standing off in the distance, unable to see Jesus said, he would never have offered himself to the lions unless he or his parents had committed some serious offense. And as these people were speculating to one another, overwhelmed by their grief, behold, Jesus suddenly came out of the cave in plain sight of them all, the pride of lions going before him, and the cubs playing with each other all around his feet. And Jesus's mother and father stood, heads bowed, in the distance as they looked on. The others also kept their distance on account of the lions, not daring to approach them. Then he said to the people there, how far superior are the untamed animals to the likes of you, seeing how they both recognize and venerate their Lord, whereas you men, even though you have been made in the image and likeness of God, have no idea who he is. Wild animals sense me and become docile, whereas men look right at me and do not even acknowledge me. The lions crossed the Jordan with Jesus. The Jordan River. After this, the waters of the Jordan spread to the right and to the left, and Jesus went across before them all, attended by the lions. Then loud enough for all to hear, Jesus called out to the lions, Now go in peace along your way, injuring no one, and may no man do you any harm until you return to the place from which you came. And they bid him farewell through their cries and their gestures. They then moved on to their proper domain. Joseph and Jesus stretched the beam. And when Jesus was eight years old, Joseph was commissioned by a wealthy young man to build for him a bed of six cubits, because at that time he was working as a carpenter specializing in wooden plows, yokes for oxen, farm equipment, and beds. And Joseph went out to the field to collect some wood, and Jesus went along with him. He ordered his servant to cut a beam with an iron saw to the given length. But he did not keep to the specified measure, cutting one of the timbers a bit too short. And after sawing two wooden planks, he produced one and placed it up against the other. Then Joseph, noticing that one board was shorter than the other, grew troubled. Then he measured it and confirmed that it was wanting, so he became frustrated and was not sure what he should do about it. As he started thinking about what to do, he headed off to find another. Jesus, when saw what had happened, and marking the perplexity of Joseph, that to him the situation seemed hopeless, comforted him, saying, Come now, let us take hold of both ends of these beams and position them together, lining up the ends, for by fitting them together precisely and pulling them to ourselves, we will make the one the same as the other. And Joseph, unsure of what Jesus had in mind by saying this, did as he was told, since he knew full well that Jesus could do whatever he willed. So Joseph grabbed the ends of the two wooden beams and pressed them flush against a wall beside him, and Jesus took the opposite ends. Once again Jesus said, hold tight to this shorter piece. And Joseph, still bewildered, took hold of it. Jesus then grabbed the other end and stretched it to himself until it was the same as the other beam. From now on Jesus assured him, be anxious for nothing, but go back now and finish your work, even as you have agreed to do, with nothing whatever to stand in your way. His father Joseph took it all in and was dumbfounded. Then he hugged and kissed a boy, saying in his heart, How blessed I am that God has given me a son like this. Then Joseph went ahead and finished the job, even as he had promised. And as soon as they returned to town, Joseph explained all that had happened to Mary. Now when Mary heard about and had seen the glorious miracles that were done by her son, she exulted, worshipping him along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore, throughout an eternity of ages. Amen. Jesus' Second Visit to a Teacher 
when all of the people started urging Joseph and Mary to enroll Jesus in a school so that he might learn his letters, Joseph came to accept just how much the boy truly understood for a child of his years and that he was becoming much more mature. So he, not refusing, decided that Jesus should not go on any longer without learning them and complied with the order of the elders. They took him to school a second time around, to an even more learned teacher, who would instruct him in human knowledge. First I will teach him Greek the teacher said to Joseph, then I will move on to Hebrew. That teacher, you see, knew all about the knowledge that this boy possessed, and it frightened him. Even so he wrote out the alphabet for him and went over it with him for several hours, but Jesus did not answer him. Then the instructor started teaching him in a forceful way, saying, say alpha. Then Jesus challenged him, if you are such a clever teacher and know the letters so well, then tell me the strength of the alpha, and I will show you that of the beta or, if you prefer, you may tell me first what is the beta, and then I will explain the alpha. Now the teacher was enraged at this, but when he lifted his hand to flog the child and beat him over the head, the boy winced in pain and cursed him, and his hand immediately withered. Then he fell face down to the ground and died. Then the boy returned to the house of Joseph and Mary. Joseph, however, grew anxious and fearful. He called Jesus's mother Mary over to himself and issued her the following command, never again will we let him out of this house. Do not let him set so much as a single foot outside the door, because everyone who angers him ends up dead. Know that my soul suffers almost to death because of him. Who knows but that one day someone might strike and kill him out of rage. O oh man of God, Mary replied, do not even think this way, but have faith instead, that the one who sent him as one born among mankind will keep him from all spite, and in his name, guard him against all evil. Final attempt to educate Jesus, Jesus teaches like a torrent of living water. Now a little while later the Jews ask Joseph a third time to coax Jesus into being schooled by yet another teacher. This teacher, someone who was close to Joseph, advised him, bring the boy to me at my school, and if I can win him over, perhaps I'll be able to teach him letters. And Joseph, knowing that it was impossible for any man to teach him anything, since his knowledge came from God alone, answered him, brother, if you think that you can teach him, then go ahead and take him to yourself. Joseph and Mary, fearful of the people, intimidated by the rulers and broken by the priests, went ahead and delivered him up to the school despite the misgivings of Joseph. The boy, however, went along cheerfully. And Jesus walked boldly into the classroom, saw the book on the podium, and, moved by the Holy Spirit, pulled it from the instructor's hands even as he was teaching from the law. Then in the sight and hearing of all, Jesus started reading and teaching them from out of the law, though he did not read from the words inscribed. It was instead through the power of the living God that he opened his mouth and, by means of the Holy Spirit, that he taught them all, as a never-ending flood of water gushing from a fountain of life. And it was with this kind of power that he taught the people the sublime things of the living God. And the hearts of the people seated their change to absolute astonishment upon hearing such words from him. And a great crowd gathered around, and they stood there, listening in amazement over the excellence of his teaching and the fluency of his speech. Everyone there, including the teacher, who dropped to the ground in adoration, was utterly astounded that a mere child like him could bring such things as these to light. But as soon as Joseph heard of it, he grew anxious and raced over to Jesus at the school, wondering to himself if this teacher might, for his lack of experience with him, be dead already. But when the schoolmaster caught sight of Joseph, he confessed, Brother, I realize that I took this boy on as a pupil, but he is brimming with all grace and wisdom. This is no mere student that you have brought to me, but a great teacher. Who can hear the words he speaks? Brother, I beg you, take him home with you. This fulfilled the scripture that reads, the river of God overflows with water. Their food you have readied, for even thus is the preparation thereof. And when the boy heard all these things, he quickly smiled at the teacher and said, because you have spoken so aptly and testified so truthfully, the one who was stricken will now be made whole. And just then his former instructor was healed. Then Joseph took the young man and returned to his home. Joseph heals another Joseph. Capernaum. After this, because their enemies had been acting so spitefully toward them, Joseph took Jesus and Mary and went away to Capernaum by the sea. Now during the time that Jesus was there, there lived this other, rather wealthy man whose name also happened to be Joseph. But this man had withered up and died from an illness and was laying lifeless on his bed. Now when Jesus heard the townspeople sorrowing and wailing and grieving over the departed, he asked Joseph, why not do this man a kindness that's in line with your benevolence, seeing that you and he both share the same name? 
Joseph then inquired of Jesus, how is it within my authority or capacity to do anything for this man? And Jesus answered him, take the cloth off of your head and lay it over the face of the man who is dead and say to him, the anointed one is saving you. The lifeless man will then be restored and rise again from his bed. Joseph, when he heard what Jesus had said, quickly rose up and ran into the house of the deceased, placed the cloth he had been wearing around his head over the face of the man on the bed and said, Jesus is saving you. And the man who had died immediately got up from his bed and asked, Who is this Jesus? Jesus blows on James Snackabite. Bethlehem. They moved on from Capernaum to Bethlehem, where Joseph could stay with Mary and Jesus in his own house. One day Joseph summoned his eldest boy James and sent him out into the garden to collect herbs and firewood for the stew and return home with them. The young Jesus, however, tagged along behind him into the garden without either Joseph or Mary knowing about it. When they got to the spot where the firewood was, James started gathering vegetables, and behold, a poisonous snake shot out of its hole and bit James on the hand, whereupon he started yelling and screaming in great pain. Then he grew faint and cried out in anguish, Oh, no, no an accursed snake has bitten my hand. The Lord Jesus, who was standing there across from him, hearing his cries of agony and seeing him in this state, all sprawled out and nearly dead, ran up to him, took him by the hand, and with nothing but a puff to the wound, he cooled it off, and James was immediately healed. His pain disappeared, and the serpent split apart. Joseph and Mary, when they heard the cry of James and the call of Jesus, ran to the garden unaware of what had happened, and found the snake dead and James healed. Jesus revives a dead child. Now after this had come to pass, there happened to be a little child who lived near Joseph who had died from an illness, and his mother was crying out in bitter anguish. Hearing that horrible wailing and the ensuing commotion, Jesus hurried over there, found the child dead, laid his hand upon his chest and said, I say to you, do not die, but go and live at your mother's side. And looking up, the child laughed. Take this boy and suckle him, he instructed the woman, and remember me. Now when the bystanders saw it, they were all amazed and they confessed, without a doubt, this lad is either himself a god, or else he is an angel of God, for every single word he speaks brings about a reality. And Jesus left them there and went to play with some other children. Jesus revives a dead construction worker. Some time later a rather large disturbance broke out where a house was being built, so Jesus got up and headed there. When he saw a man lying there dead, Jesus took him by the hand and said, Get up, sir, and do your work. And the man rose right up and worshipped him. And when the people saw this thing, they were all astounded and cried aloud, This boy assuredly comes from heaven, since he has delivered so many from death, and as long as he remains alive, he has the power to save them all. Jesus blesses his family. The glory of God shines upon him. Joseph took his sons, James, Joseph, Judah, Simeon, and his two daughters to a banquet. Jesus and his mother Mary met them there, along with her sister Mary, daughter of Cleophas. And when they had all arrived, he sanctified and blessed them all. The Lord God had given this Mary over to Cleophas and Anna, her father and mother, since they had presented Jesus's mother to the Lord. She was known by the same name, Mary, that her parents might feel somewhat consoled. Now Jesus would always be the first to eat, for not one of them would ever venture to dine, drink, recline at table, or break bread, unless he had blessed them first. And if for some reason he was not present, they would wait around for him. And whenever he did not wish to come for food and drink, then neither did Joseph, Mary, or any of his brothers, the sons of Joseph. These brothers of his would obey him with all severity, seeing his life as the light of a lamp. And whenever Jesus would sleep, be it either night or day, the glory of God would shine on him. May all praise and honor be to him forevermore. Amen and Amen. Jesus stays behind in the temple. Caravan to Nazareth, the temple in Jerusalem. Every year, Jesus's parents would go to the Passover feast in Jerusalem. And when he was twelve years old they traveled up, as their custom was. And after the feast was over, and they had satisfied the number of days required, they all started out for home. And even as they were all returning, the Lord Jesus headed back for Jerusalem. His parents knew nothing about him staying behind in the temple among the teachers, elders, and learned men of Jerusalem. He posed many questions to them and answered them concerning many issues having to do with their expertise. For example, Jesus asked them, whose son is this Messiah? David's, they replied. Jesus therefore questioned them, then why in the spirit does David call him Lord when it states, the Lord said to my Lord sit here to my right until I have made all who oppose you a stool for your feet?
Then this particularly eminent rabbi prodded him, have you read books? Not only have I read books, Jesus replied, but also what is in those books. Then he gave them a detailed explanation of the books of the law, the rules, the legislations, and all of the riddles that were interwoven into the prophetic scriptures, matters that were too profound for the mind of any ever to unravel. At that point the rabbi said, I have never seen or even heard of such things before. What do all of you suppose will become of this boy? Jesus astonishes an astronomer and a philosopher. The temple in Jerusalem. And when this astronomer who was there asked the Lord Jesus, have you ever studied astronomy? He answered him by revealing to him the number of spheres and celestial objects, together with their triangular, square, and sextile facets, which ones moved prograde and which ones moved retrograde, their various proportions and their various forecasts, along with many other depths, never yet plumbed by the minds of men. There was also this philosopher among them who was very skilled in medicine and the physical sciences, who asked the Lord Jesus, have you ever studied medicine? He answered him with an explanation of both medicine and its theoretical underpinnings. Moreover, he defined precisely what lies above the powers of nature, along with all that is subject thereto, the physical potential, and the interactions between the body and its fluids, and how they respond to one another. He also revealed the number of its constituent parts, such as bones, arteries, veins, and nerves, the various physical aspects of the body, namely warmth and dryness, coolness and moisture, as well as their various functions, how the soul controls the body, and the various senses and modalities that are open to them, the capacity for language, desire and anger, and last of all, the composition and decomposition of the body, and a whole host of other subjects that have eluded the grasp of all mankind. Then that philosopher got up and worshipped Jesus, saying, O oh Jesus, my Lord! From now on, I will follow you and work for you. Joseph and Mary discover that Jesus is missing caravan to Nazareth, the temple in Jerusalem. But his parents imagined that Jesus must have been in the crowd with them somewhere. And after they had done a full day's walking, they went looking for him among their kin, and when he was nowhere to be found, they grew troubled and headed back to the city to search for him. They found him at last on the third day, sitting in the temple amid the teachers, hearing the law and posing questions to them. And all of those who heard him there were astounded by his understanding and his exposition. And everyone there paid careful attention to him, and wondered how in the world a mere child like this could throw so much light on passages from out of the law and parables within the prophets, leaving the elders and the teachers of the people utterly unable to speak. It was even as they were all addressing these and other issues that the Lady Saint Mary came walking in after having wandered around all over with Joseph for three days seeking after him. And when she saw that he was seated in the presence of doctors, asking them questions and giving them answers, Joseph and Mary were both astonished. Then his mother Mary approached him and asked, Why have you put us through all this, my child? I'll have you know that your father and I have gone through a great deal of trouble in searching for you, and we worried about you all that time. Jesus then replied to them, why did you go looking all over? Were you not aware that it was needful for me to be employed in the house of my father, taking care of his affairs? But they failed to grasp the sense in which he meant for them to hear his words. But the scribes and Pharisees then spoke up, are you the mother of this lad? Yes I am, she replied. Oh Mary, they all confessed, how joyful are you among women. You are truly blessed to have brought forth a boy like him, for such a blessing has God lavished on the fruit of your womb. Never before have we seen or heard such glorious and excellent wisdom. Jesus then rose up and followed his mother, going down with them and traveling with them unto Nazareth, where he lived in obedience to them. His mother treasured up all that had been said in her heart. And Jesus waxed ever wiser and wiser, all the time growing in grace and stature, and the esteem of God and men. To him be boundless glory forevermore. Amen. Jesus begins to hide his activities, diligently studies the law. Nazareth. This marks the time when Jesus began hiding his miracles and secret works. He dedicated himself to a careful study of the law until the end of his thirtieth year, the age at which the Father acknowledged him openly at the Jordan with the sound of his voice and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, addressing him with this declaration from the sky above, This is my Son, whom I love, and in whom I take delight. He is the one we worship with all honor, because he brought us from the womb of our mother, calling us into being and bringing us to life. He who for our sakes has taken on a human form and rescued us, that he might embrace us with eternal kindness and freely show us the greatness and abundance of his mercy and goodness. May all glory, praise, power and dominion be to him from now on and forevermore. Amen. Introduction to the Life of Joseph the Carpenter, Instructions to Spread the Gospel. 
in the name of God, three who are comprised of one. The narrative of the death of our father, the aged and venerable Joseph the carpenter. Brothers, may his blessings and his prayers sustain us all. Amen. His entire lifetime amounted to 111 years, and his passing from this world took place on the 26th of Abib which is also known as Ab. May we be upheld by his prayer. Amen. And it was truly none other than our Lord Jesus Christ who disclosed this narrative to his most reverend disciples on the Mount of Olives, all about the labors of Joseph and also of his final days. And the holy apostles preserved this address and left it in written form in the Jerusalem library. May their prayers sustain us all. Amen. One day it happened that our Lord, God, and Savior Jesus Christ was sitting on the Mount of Olives with his followers who had gathered there. And he addressed them as follows, brothers, friends, and sons whom the Father has chosen out of all mankind. You know how I have frequently spoken to you about the crucifixion I must undergo, and of the death that I must endure in order to redeem Adam and his children, and how I will arise from death. I will now entrust you with the teaching of the sacred gospel which has been preached to you already, so that you might make it known around the world. I will, moreover, give you power from on high, filling you with the Holy Spirit. And you are to preach repentance and the remission of sin throughout each and every nation. For if a man could find so much as a single cup of water that is from the world to come, it would seem far greater and more vast to him than the collective riches of this earth. Moreover, the ground covered by even a single foot in my father's house is beyond the wealth of this whole world. Truly a single, joyful hour in the home of the godly is more gracious and dear than a thousand years among of elders, since their wailing and mourning will never cease, nor ever will their tears stop flowing, nor will they even once enjoy any comfort or rest. And now, O oh my distinguished members, go and proclaim this in every nation, saying to them, Truly the Savior, the administrator of justice, is looking diligently into the inheritance that is due. And the angels will throw down their opponents and fight on their behalf on the day of battle. And he will closely scrutinize every senseless and baseless word that mankind has spoken, and they will all be forced to give account. For even as death is inescapable, so also will every single one of man's works, whether they are good or bad, be spread out on the day of judgment. Also, be sure to relate to them this message I am giving you today, let not the strong man glory in his might, nor the rich man in his wealth, but if any man must glory, let him glorify the Lord. The Death of Joseph After many years had come and gone, the elderly Joseph arrived at a ripe old age. Despite working continuously, his body never grew frail, nor did his vision ever fail, nor ever did his teeth fall out, nor was he ever senile his whole life long, but he, like a young lad, went about his business spryly and energetically, with his arms and legs intact and free from aches and pains. Altogether, his lifetime amounted to 111 years, stretching his days to their furthest extent. Now two of Joseph's oldest boys, Justice and Simeon, were married and had their own families. Both of his daughters were also married and living in their own homes. That left Ozes and the lesser James living in Joseph's house with my virgin mother. I lived with them blamelessly as one of his sons, calling Mary my mother and Joseph my father, doing whatever they would tell me to. I never defied them, Butelways obeyed them no matter what they would say, even as other men who are brought forth on this earth are inclined to do. I never did provoke them to anger, nor did I talk back to them or contradict them, either. On the contrary, as the apple of my eye did I lavish them both with love and affection. And after all this, it happened that the death and passing from this world of the pious and elderly Joseph was drawing near, as is the case for every man that is born of this earth. And even as he was at the point of death, an angel of the Lord informed him that his passing was near. He therefore grew fearful and perplexed. He then rose up and traveled on to Jerusalem. And when he went into the Lord's temple, he poured forth his prayers before the sanctuary, pleading, O oh, God, author of every solace, God of all pity, and Lord over the whole human race, God of my soul, God of my body, and God of my spirit, I worship you and plead with you. O oh, my Lord, my God, if my days are at an end, and the hour of my passing from this world is at hand, I beg of you, send Michael, the great prince of your holy angels, to accompany me, that my miserable soul might leave this tortured frame of mine without incident, free from any threat or fear. For unspeakable fear and dread seize all bodies on their dying day, be they either male or female, wild or domestic animal, or whatever crawls along the ground, or flies through the air. Every creature under heaven that breathes in the breath of life becomes panic-stricken as their souls fearfully and woefully pass away from their bodies. Oh, my Lord and my God, let your holy angel be there to help ease the separation between my body and soul, 
and do not let the face of the guardian angel appointed to me from the time of my birth turn away from me now, but may he accompany me on my journey, even until he brings me to you. Let his expression be pleasing to me and comfort my heart, and let him go with me in peace. Let not the demons approach me with their frightful faces on the way that I must go, until I arrive in your delightful presence. Let not the gatekeepers keep my soul from paradise. Show not forth my sins so as to condemn me before the terror of your judgment seat. Do not permit the lions to lunge on me, nor allow the swells of the fiery sea to overwhelm my soul, before I have gazed upon your face, so glorious and divine, for every soul must face these things. O oh, God, most upright judge, who with justice and fairness will pass judgment on all mankind, and will pay them back for what they have done. O oh, my Lord, my God, I beg of you, draw near to me with your compassion, and shine your light upon my path, that I might draw near to you, for you are a fountain overflowing with every glorious thing, and are possessed of everlasting glory. Amen. And it happened afterward that when he had returned to his own home in Nazareth of Galilee, Joseph was stricken by an illness that confined him to his bed. And it was at that time that he passed on, as is the lot of all mankind. This disease, you see, completely overwhelmed him. From the day that he was born, he had never yet suffered such an affliction, and truly it pleased Christ to arrange this end for the righteous Joseph. And for forty years he remained unwed, afterward he cared for his wife another forty-nine until she died. And a year after her death, the priests entrusted my mother, the blessed Mary to him, to look after her until such time as she should wed. She lived in his house for two whole years, and during her third year in the house of Joseph, when she was fifteen, she brought me into this world by a means so mysterious that no created being can recount it, nor yet understand it, but only myself, my father, and the Holy Spirit, who are of one substance with me. The age of my father therefore, that venerable old man, was one hundred and eleven years, as it had been decreed by my father in heaven. And it was on the twenty-sixth of Abib that his soul left his body. For it was then that the choice gold started to lose its luster, and the silver to wear out through use. By this I mean his wisdom and his intellect. He also refused all food and drink. And having lost his carpentry skills, he began to let his business go. And so it happened that, in the early morning hours of the twenty-sixth day of Abib, that that honorable man, the aged Joseph, lay upon his bed, surrendering his troubled soul. He therefore opened his mouth and cried, Cursed was the day I was brought into this world. Cursed was the womb that carried me. Cursed were the bowels that moved for me. Cursed were the feet that I sat and rested on. Cursed were the breasts that nursed me. Cursed were the hands that carried me and cared for me until I was grown. For in sin was I conceived, and in sin did my mother long for me. Cursed are my lips and my tongue, which have brought up and spoken foolishness, scandal, lies, ignorance, ridicule, gossip, dishonesty, and hypocrisy. Cursed are my eyes, which have gazed upon scandal. Cursed are my ears, which have rejoiced in the slanderous words of others. Cursed are my hands which have taken things that were not theirs. Cursed are my stomach and my guts, which have longed for forbidden foods. Cursed is my throat, which as a blazing fire has consumed all that it has come across. Cursed are my feet, which have taken paths offensive to God. Cursed is my body, as is also my pathetic soul, which has already deserted God, who fashioned it. What will I do, when I am made to stand before the righteous judge, when he will demand an account for all the deeds that have been accumulating from my youth? Cursed is every man who dies in his sins. Behold, that same event that overtook my father Jacob as his soul sailed away from his body has truly overtaken me. Oh, how miserable I am today and fit to be mourned. God, however, and no one else, will concern himself with my body and soul and deal with them as he sees fit. Then I went over to Joseph and found his soul in its distress, for he was suffering terribly. And I said to him, Bless you, Father Joseph. How are you feeling, O man of honor? And he responded, Bless you too, my beloved son. Truly do I say to you that pain and fear encompass me, but my soul grew still when I heard your voice. O Jesus of Nazareth! Jesus who rescues me! Jesus who sets my soul free! Jesus who defends me! O Jesus! How sweet is your name in my mouth, and in the mouths of all who cherish it! O all-seeing eye, and all-hearing ear, hearken to the words I speak! I worship you, and serve you today in all humility, and my tears rain down before your face. You are my God, and my Lord, even as the angel has reminded me so many times, particularly on that day, when wayward thoughts tossed my soul to and fro concerning the holy and virgin Mary, of whom I was secretly plotting to rid myself, though she was bearing you within her womb. At the time, 
that I was weighing my options, behold, these angels of the Lord appeared in my sleep and related this incredible mystery to me. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take on Mary as your wife, do not be sad or speak such unbecoming words with regard to her conception, for she is carrying the child of the divine inspiration and will bring a son into the world who will be called Jesus since he will free his people from their sins. Oh my Lord, please do not permit me to suffer on account of my lack of knowledge concerning your birth, neither of the mystery involved. Oh my Lord, I also recall the occasion when that boy died of a snackabite, how his family wished to turn you over to Herod, accusing you of killing him, but even so, you brought him back from death and restored him to his mother and father. How I then came up to you, grabbed your hand and admonished you, watch yourself, my son. At that time you answered me, are you not seen as my fleshly father? I will show you who I truly am. For all of these reasons, my Lord and me God, please do not be mad at me, nor call me to account for that instance. I am your servant, your servant girl's son, but you are my Lord, my God and my deliverer, and assuredly the Son of God. Now when my father Joseph had spoken this, he was worn from all his weeping. And I could see that death clearly held him in its sway. Then my unblemished virgin mother stood to her feet, walked over to me and said, Oh, my beloved son, this honorable old man Joseph Isaven, now at the point of death. Oh, dearest mother, I replied, truly the burden of death is shared by all things that are brought forth on earth, for death has its way with all of mankind. Even you, O oh virgin mother, must experience the same fate as other mortals. Nevertheless neither your departure, nor that of this righteous man, qualifies as the true death, but rather as eternal life. Furthermore, even I must die with regard to the body that I got from you. Even so, rise up dearest mother of mine, and go over to the blessed old man Joseph, that you might bear witness to all that takes place as his soul rises up from his body. My spotless mother Mary walked over to where Joseph was and went inside. There at his feet I sat and watched over him, for by then the signs of death could be seen in his face. And that honorable old man lifted up his head and fixed his eyes upon me, but had no strength to speak to me on account of the pains of death that had taken him. But he kept on gasping for air, and I held his hands for an entire hour, at which time he turned and looked at me, motioning to me not to leave his side. At that moment, I held my hand up to his chest and sensed his soul around his throat, ready to depart its chamber. And when my virgin mother saw me touching his body, she also felt his feet. And when she found that they were lifeless and cold, she said to me, Oh, my beloved son, truly his feet are stiffening and are even now as cold as snow. She then called Joseph's sons and daughters, saying, Come now, all of you, and gather all around your father, for he is surely at the gates of death. Then his daughter Asher remarked, O oh my brothers, this is certainly the same affliction that claimed the life of my own dear mother. And she mourned and wept in bitterness, whereupon all of Joseph's other children likewise cried alongside her, my mother and myself weeping along with them. And glancing southward, I saw death already drawing near, and all of Gehenna with him, closely guarded by his army and his helpers, flames shooting out of their clothing, faces, and mouths. And when my father Joseph saw them coming, his eyes welled up with tears, and at that moment he groaned in a very strange way. When I saw him gasping furiously, I pushed death back, and all his minions. And I called upon my holy father and said, O father of every mercy the all-seeing eye and the all-hearing ear hearken to my prayers and petitions on behalf of the elderly Joseph. Send in the brightness of all your angels, Michael, the prince of angels, together with Gabriel, the proclaimer of light. Allow the entire host of them to walk alongside of the soul of my father Joseph until they bring it near to you. This is the moment when my father needs your compassion the most. And I say to you also that each and every saint, indeed each and every man that is born to this world, be they either just or corrupt, must necessarily pass away. Then Michael and Gabriel approached the soul of my father Joseph. Then they took and wrapped it in a glistening cloth. This was the means by which his spirit was given into the hands of my good father, who granted him peace. None of his children yet knew that Joseph had died. And the angels defended his soul from the demons of darkness who were blocking the way, glorifying God until they had conveyed it into the abode of the devout. Now his corpse was lying flat on its back and devoid of blood. I therefore reached out and straightened his eyes, shut his mouth with my own hand, and said to the Virgin Mary, O, oh, mother of mine, where is that ability which he so aptly showed throughout his lifetime in this world? Sadly, it has gone away, and is as though it never was. And when his children overheard my conversation with my spotless and virgin mother, they knew that he had breathed his last, and they burst into tears and mourned for him. Your father's death, I explained to them, is in truth not really death, 
but rather it is endless life, for he has been freed from this world and its concerns, and has moved on to endless and eternal rest. And hearing these words, they tore their clothes and wept aloud. And the people of Nazareth and Galilee converged on the scene, when they heard their weeping, and they wept from the third hour all the way until the ninth. And at the ninth hour they all went together to the bed of Joseph. And they rubbed his body with precious ointments, and raised it up. But I prayed that same prayer to my father in the heavenly language which I had made with my own hand, before I was carried in the womb of my mother Mary. And when I had completed it, I said Amen, and the entire host of angels appeared. And I ordered two of them to extend their glistening robes, and to enshroud the body of the blessed old man Joseph in them. At that point I spoke to Joseph, saying, The stench of death and corruption will have no power over you, nor will so much as a single worm ever come from out of your body. None of its limbs will ever be broken, nor will a hair on your head be moved from its place. O oh Joseph, my father, no part of your body will ever be lost, but it will remain intact and never decompose, even until the thousand-year feast. I will bless and repay in the assembly of virgins anyone who should make an offering on your special day. And on the day of your memorial, whosoever should feed the wretched, the poor, the widows, and the orphans in your name from the work of his hands will never lack anything good, as long as he lives. And to anyone who has, so much as offered a cup of water or wine to drink to either widow or orphan in your name, I will place him in your care, that you may travel along with him as he enters into the millennial feast. And to every man who should offer a gift on the day of your commemoration, I will bless and repay in the assembly of virgins, to one I will give thirty times over, to another, sixty, and to yet another, a hundred. And as for anyone who should write down the story of your life, and of your labors, and of your passing from this earth, and even this narrative, that is from my mouth, him I will commit to your keeping, as long as he lives. And when his soul leaves his body, and he has parted from this realm, I will burn the book of his sins, and not afflict him with any penalty on judgment day, but he will travel through the sea of flames, passing across without trouble or pain. And to every poor man who can offer none of these things, this will be what he should do, if a son is born to him, he is to name him Joseph, so that neither poverty nor untimely death might ever come to pass in that house. After this, the leading men of that town, gathered together at the spot where Joseph's body had been placed, bringing with them burial shrouds with which they wished to wrap him up, according to the way the Jews prepare the bodies of their dead. But they found that his shroud held tight, clinging like iron to his body, for when they would have taken it off, they found it impossible to loosen or budge, nor could they find a linen edge, which astonished them to no end. Finally they carried him over to a place where there was a cave and opponent gate, so they could lay his body to rest alongside those of his forebears. Just then I called to mind the day that he traveled with me into Egypt, and of the tremendous hardships that for my sake he was compelled to endure. And I mourned his passing for quite some time, saying as I was sprawled out over his corpse, O death, which causes all knowledge to disappear and brings about tears and sorrows in abundance, surely it is my Father, God himself, who has given you this power. Because men perish for the transgression of Adam and his wife Eve, and death does not spare anyone. Even so, nothing ever happens to anyone, or is brought upon him without my father commanding it first. Surely there have been men whose lives reached nine hundred years, but even these have passed away. And though there were others who lived even longer, all of them have come to this end, and not one of them can say, I have never tasted death. For the Lord does not send the same affliction twice. Hence it has satisfied my father to inflict it upon mankind but once. Death goes out the very instant that it sees the order coming down from heaven, and it says, I will go forth against that man and afflict him most grievously. Then, in a flash it sets upon the soul and overpowers it, doing with it as it pleases. Because Adam violated my father's decree, you see, and failed to act in line with his will, the anger of my father seethed over him, and he then condemned him Tadith, and this was how death came into the world. If, however, Adam had kept my father's laws, death would never have gotten the better of him. Don't you know that I could ask my father to send me down a chariot of fire to take my father Joseph's body up to the peaceful place that it might live among the spirits there? But because of Adam's disobedience, the trouble and violence that come with death has befallen all of mankind. And it is for this reason that I myself must die in the flesh, that I might secure grace for those who are my handiwork. Having said this, I embraced the body of my father Joseph and wept over it. Then they opened up the mouth of the tomb and placed his body into it, near to that of his father Jacob. And at the time of his passing, he had lived one hundred and eleven years. Never had a tooth in his mouth pained him, nor had his eyesight ever grown dim, nor ever did his body bend 
or his strength ever fail him, but he worked at his carpenter's trade even until his dying day, which was on the 26th of Abib. And after Joseph, who was worn out by old age, had died and received a burial alongside his forebears, the blessed Mary went to live with her sister's children. And when we apostles heard these words from our Savior, we rose up in joy and prostrated ourselves in his honor. O Savior of us all, we implored him, show us your grace. Now we all have heard the life-giving word. Even so, we still have questions about the fates of Enoch and Elijah, O Savior of ours, for they were both reprieved from death. For truly they dwell in the place of the just even unto this very day, nor have their bodies known decay. Even so, that aged carpenter, Joseph was, after all, your father according to the flesh. And you have ordered us to go throughout the world and preach to them your holy gospel. And you have said, relate to them the account of the passing of my father Joseph, and honor him every year with a solemn holiday and festival, and let them know that anyone who takes anything away from this narrative or adds anything to it, sins by so doing. Yet we are especially eager to understand why it is that you did not cause Joseph to be immortal like these, though he called you his son from the day that you were born in Bethlehem, and you say yourself that he was both chosen and righteous. And our Savior answered us, Truly my father's prophecy regarding the disobedience of Adam has now been fulfilled. Everything is ordered by my father according to his will and pleasure. For if any man should despise the commands of God, and an imitation of the devil continue to sin, his life is prolonged, that he might have a change of heart, and think about how he must be given over to death. If, however, anyone is quick to do good works, his life is also prolonged that the more his life is lengthened and discussed, the more that upright men might imitate him. But when you see a man whose mind tends toward anger, his days are indeed cut short, for these are the ones who are taken in the prime of their lives. Therefore every prophecy that has been spoken by my father concerning mankind must be fulfilled in every one of its aspects. Yet with regard to Enoch and Elijah, and how they are alive to this day in the very flesh in which they were born, and with regard to my father Joseph, whose body has not been spared as were theirs, indeed, even if a man were to live many thousands of years upon this earth, he would nevertheless at some point be compelled to exchange his life for death. And my brothers I say to you that Enoch and Elijah must return to this world toward the close of time and be slain as well. To be more specific, this will happen on the day of upset, terror, confusion, and evil. For because of the reproach with which he will be revealed, the Antichrist will mutilate the bodies of the four who are to disgrace him utterly, when they expose him for his ungodliness during the time that they are alive, and he will pour their blood out like water. O, oh, our Lord, God, and Savior, we asked, who are these four about whom you have spoken, those whom the Antichrist will cut off on account of the reproach that they will lay to his charge? They are Enoch, Elijah, Sheila, and Tabitha, the Lord replied. When we heard our Savior say this to us, we all exulted and rejoiced, giving glory and thanks to the Lord God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, honor, dignity, power, authority, and praise, the good Father along with him, together with the life-giving Holy Spirit, from now on and forevermore. Amen. Here ends the complete infancy gospel, which through the aid of the Most High God has been completed in accordance with what we found written in the original.